go. And it is always fantastic when we get a chance to talk to Robert Griffin III, Baylor Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, and right now a rock star on ESPN with what he does and a friend of the show. Day one, Robert Griffin III was a part of what we did back in April of 2020. So, hey, man, how you been? And, and is it as busy being a broadcaster during the week, getting ready for a game as it is a player? Oh, man. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me on again. Uh, it's been a long time, too long, if you ask me. So I appreciate you letting me come on here with you. And and then as far as being busy, it is uh, it is by far busier as a broadcaster. And I think I, I believe that because as a player, you know, you have a, you know, you have a routine. You're going to be up from 6, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., 9 p.m. talking football, look, studying tape and doing all those different things. But as a broadcaster, you just don't know where your time is coming from and you're, you're preparing for one show while you're on another show and then it's another show after that and then you're having to travel to all different types of places around the country and it's, it's difficult. It's very hard to manage that time with also spending time with the family. So it, it actually makes you have to be a better planner because um, for me with a young family, three daughters, seven, five, and three, and, and my wife, uh, with the fourth daughter on the way, I got to make sure that I'm doing everything possible to spend enough time with my family because I want to see them and be a part of their lives. By the way, congratulations on that news as well on, on number four, RG3 with us on 365 Sports. Robert, uh, you got to do uh, UCF and, and Cincinnati last week, which I, I thought was one of the better games uh, in the country and, and, and had a great ending uh, to it. UCF uh, winning in the bounce house. Uh, what are your thoughts on on those two teams, especially, you know, now that we know we're not going to have a non-Power 5 team in the playoff, but they're they're both coming to the Big 12 next year. Both look like they're they're in pretty good standing and, and, and on the come up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about – two teams that are that are led by coaches and Luke Fickle at Cincinnati and Gus Malzahn at UCF uh, that know how to win, have won uh, at an extremely high level. Uh, and now they're going into the Big 12. And when you look at their teams, I thought that they uh, by far looked like Big 12 teams. Uh, and I think that was the, the biggest thing for them is they know how they match up against the group of five. They know how they match up against the American Conference. How do they match up against the Big 12? Uh, and we all know like the, the myth out there is that and the Big 12 doesn't play any defense, and anyone who's still running with that narrative just hasn't been paying attention to what's happened in the Big 12 over the last five to seven years. So both these teams uh, have a unique style of defense, I will say. Cincinnati has been one of the top defenses in the country over the years uh, with Luke Fickle, and UCF, uh, believe it or not, has, has also been uh, one of those teams, and they like to blitz the quarterback a lot, and we saw that in the game. It was a very interesting game. Of course, John Rice Plumley went out to the starting quarterback for UCF early in the game, but Mikey Keene came in late and, and led him to victory uh, to knock off a team in Cincinnati that most people would say uh, is the most dominant force uh, for the group of five schools. So I'm excited for them to join the Big 12. I know the Big 12 is clearly excited to bring in some more winning programs, and it's going to be interesting. Because one thing I know, I was recruited by Gus Malzahn when he was at Tulsa as the offensive coordinator uh, in 2007, 2008. And this man almost got me to go to Tulsa. Mm. So now you're telling me that he's equipped with a Central Florida team that is going to be joining a Power Five conference. It's only going to increase his ability to recruit and bring in talent to a school that uh, is in the city that has no NFL team. Uh, and they are Orlando's football team. So there's a lot of growth potential there for them, and I think that's really great news for the Big 12. Robert, how much familiarity do you get when you watch Tennessee's offense? <laughs> Come on, guys. You know that's our offense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Um, to see what they're doing, um, not only just from a tempo standpoint, but how they stress the defense, throwing the deep ball, Hendon Hooker. I know a lot of people talk about his age, but – you can't blame him for, for COVID and for everything that's happened. And he's playing in college still, and he's playing at a high level. I watched them throw the ball vertically. Uh, as Coach always told us, you know, the only way to score is to try to score. The only way to try to put up points is to try to put up points. And that's what Tennessee does at an extremely high level. They throw the vertical ball. They run the football. Hendon Hooker runs just enough to keep a defense off balance uh, and have them guessing about what's going to happen next. So I'm, I've been uh, head over heels 
watching this team because, it, you know, we have two coaches from our staff, really three coaches from our staff when I was at Baylor that, is, that have run successful offenses all around the country with Dino Babers at Syracuse. And then, of course, Kendall Browse is offensive coordinator at Arkansas and Jeff Levy as the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. Um, I think those guys have been deserving uh, and have earned the ability to, to go be head coaches. Of course, of course, Dino's been a head coach for some time now. Um, but Kendall and Levy, uh, when you see what, what Heifel's been able to do um, at Tennessee, I think that gives other people confidence that, hey, this offense can be run at an extremely high level in the SEC or any conference around the country. And I thought the big thing for Tennessee last week going against Kentucky was their defense showed up. Uh, this, it wasn't a 44-41 to 41 game similar to what they did against Alabama. Uh, and if their defense shows up like that for the rest of the year, they're going to really be the favorite to win the national championship. You ran the Baylor line, of course, when you were in Waco. Uh, you had the tunnel walk or what it was onto the field or in on on the way to the field at Ann Arbor and the, and the big house. And then you, you ran – uh, at UCF, I think right into the water, isn't it? Was that the most fun of all of them? <laughs> uh, I would say the 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 run at Baylor with the with the Baylor line was the most memorable, just because I was able to do that for the first time in my alma mater, and also did it with my wife. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the most memorable. Um, the most nostalgic was the Big House because I'd never been, and uh, growing up as a youngster. You know, I watched Charles Woodson, Desmond Howard, and all those guys compete there. Um, so to be able to walk down that tunnel and have that moment with the team was really, really cool. And that got a lot of traction on social media amongst other places. But this one with the, the spirit splash, I mean, guys, there's no, there was no other experience like that. I mean, the students were, were nuts. Uh, I, I face planted, you know, running through the, <laughs> running through the fountain. It, it was beyond fun. And then I lost my wedding ring uh, during the process of running through the fountain. So I'm sitting there like, man, like I, I got this great moment on camera with the, with the students at UCF. You don't, you no one's ever done this before. This, this is really cool. It's awesome. And my marriage is over because I lost my wedding ring. So the fact that I was able to find the ring, not me, but one of the students um, found the ring after we were looking for it for like 35 minutes. Uh, just made it all come full circle and kept my marriage alive. Um, my wife was in the in the fountain, you know, with the dress on, uh, barefoot, uh, pregnant. So that's how hard we were looking for that ring and how much it meant. So like, listen, it was it's all fun and games until you lose your wedding ring. I just ask any married man. Did you get it back? Yes, I have it. Okay. It's on my finger right now. I just looked at it to make sure it was still there. <laughs> that's good. Uh, but. No, nah, that, that run was extremely fun. It's, it's one of the most um, exciting things that homecoming traditions that are around the country. And the bounce house is notorious for the, the stadium bouncing. And we got to experience that being there. And if you guys notice, like you haven't said, hey, you did something every single week. We just pick and choose like which ones we think um, are worth that time to go out there and get done. Um, I think more colleges are going to start pointing that out and saying, hey, we want you to come do this. And I think that's just bringing more attention to the college football game. Uh, and that's what we're supposed to do. It's not just supposed to be about the game. College football isn't just about the game. It's about everything going on around the game. Did you pick up enough uh, from being in the Michigan Tunnel to have a, a different opinion on what we saw with Michigan and Michigan State and that whole tunnel fracas that occurred? Yeah, I mean, to be down there for the first time and see how tight quarters it is, and you got two teams coming down the same tunnel, um, you know, when it comes to Michigan Michigan State, like, if you don't have the opinion that that, that was completely uncalled for, out of hand, um, you know, unsportsmanlike, then I think you're looking at the wrong thing. Uh, if you want to go out and dominate your opponent, dominate them on the football field. If you want to go out and, and essentially – uh, jump your opponent, then jump them on the football field with your with your play. Uh, after the game is over, it, that stuff is all has to subside. I understand the rivalries and I understand uh, the disappointment from from going out and not winning a football game. But at the end of the day, you can't use a helmet as a weapon or go out there and and have four or five guys jumping multiple players from the opposing team. Uh, I said this before earlier in the week. I thought it set college football back. It's just a, a horrible. Um, visual 
and just think about those kids' parents and what they're thinking about uh, in those in that moment when they see their kid uh, getting assaulted in the way that they were. Um, now, I don't know what's going to come about that, but yeah, the tunnel is extremely tight quarters. Um, I don't think that Michigan's going to change that at all. Maybe they should just, when the teams leave the field, have one team go at a time. I mean, that's about all you can do. They're not going to widen that tunnel because it's so such a prestigious thing, uh, as you talk about with the walk coming down in Ann Arbor uh, earlier in the year. I can feel that. You can feel the history in the in that tunnel. Robert, you have a and in Florida this week, and those are two teams uh, whose seasons – I know Florida might have gone about how you think with a new coach and all the things that they have to do, but A and M was thinking about hearing their name called in those CFP rankings, and that is not going to happen at all this year. How would you fix what's going on at A and M? Ooh, man, that is a great question. And based off my prep, like the number one thing they have to figure out is the quarterback spot, right? They've had Hanks King, Mac Johnson, and now they got Connor Wigman out there you know, swinging the ball around at the quarterback spot. They're extremely young. So I look at their schedule and I look at the games that they've lost. Uh, they've lost a lot of close games. And that's football, especially football in, in the SEC. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm a believer that the Big 12 and, and all of the other conferences can compete with the SEC top to bottom. But when you're Texas A&M and you're expected to play for a national championship and you've lost three, four games uh, by less than, than 10 points, you know, that, that's tough. That's tough sledding in any in any conference. So if they figure out the quarterback spot, uh, this experience for these players, you know, everyone's talking about how they're five stars and, and all the NIL money. Uh, this is a great experience for, for these young players to go through to understand that it doesn't matter how much money you're given, you still got to go out on the football field and perform at the highest level. And when you are given that money, there are high expectations. So you talk about a coach in Jimbo Fisher who's won a national title and they're talking about, hey, you know, Jimbo's seat is hot. And is some of that premature? Yeah, it's premature. But when you bring in a coach, you pay him that much money and you bring in all these five-star athletes and you pay him that much money, uh, there's going to be high expectations. And every college football fan base has high expectations. And right now A&M at three and five is not living up to that. Uh, and if they don't start winning, it's only going to get worse. Robert, have you had a chance with all the stuff you're doing on the weekend and games yourself to watch Baylor at all? <laughs> yes, come on, guys. <laughs> Listen, we, we we find the time. We make sure that we're, we're locked in. If I call a Baylor game, um, I actually I take a lot of um, – I don't know what the right word is, but try to take a very the, the most professional approach I possibly can and take pride in the fact that I can call the game honest. Last year, we called the BYU game and the Oklahoma State game and got that feedback from not only the fans, but also ESPN that uh, was able to, you know, not be a, a quote unquote homer. Um, so when I'm not calling the games, I'm a fan. Listen, this, this is my alma mater. I love, I love the university. I love Baylor Nation. And I've paid attention to what's going on and, you know, looking forward to seeing, you know, how they go out and, and try to dominate Oklahoma. Well, they, they obviously seem to maybe turn the corner with what they did in Lubbock, and the defense was flying around like a bunch of fire ants and, and beat up Texas Tech, and, and now in Norman. And uh, ought to be interesting, of course, anytime I think about Oklahoma, even though it was home, is your throw to Terrence Williams and the dramatic win that maybe won you the Heisman Trophy and built a brand-new stadium. Yeah, the Oklahoma fans, don't they don't love that story. Of course, we know that, and... Um, but that was a special game, a special moment that took a lot of different people uh, to make happen. Like even before that game against Oklahoma, when we were uh, on the road in, in Lawrence, Kansas, and we were down 17, and I think the fourth quarter, um, people don't remember that game, but we do all the guys on that team do. Cause if we didn't win that football game, there was no hunt. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we were able to come back, Kevin Reese had a great game helping get, get us back on track uh, to set up that moment weeks later against Oklahoma with T-Dub, who just does what, what T-Dub would do, right? He was a quarterback's best friend. I scrambled out of the pocket. He broke his route off. I saw what he did and threw the football. Uh, the rest was history. And, uh, you know, he might have been a little dramatic at the end when he kind of, like, rolled out of the back of the end zone like he was hurting, you know. But that that was T-Dub for you. And that, that moment will always be etched in the history books. It'll always be etched in all of our minds. And Oklahoma fans <laughs> – have given me a tough time when I called the game just because of plays like that. 
Uh, but right now they're fighting for their lives. You know, Brent Venables, you know, five and three at Oklahoma is like, you know, pigs are flying in their opinion. If they see three losses ever, they're, they're upset. And I know that coach Aranda is upset right now. Uh, he's ha- He's not happy. He's, um, looking at the positive side of being five and three when the expectations coming into the year were to go repeat as Big 12 champions. And I think the adversity that Baylor has gone through this season um, actually shows you just how great of a coach uh, Dave Aranda is. Because uh, a lot of coaches would fold in that, in that situation, knowing what the expectations are, knowing that they, they're not going to achieve that, that part of it, but still getting their players and their team to play hard and, and get better throughout the season. I've also enjoyed watching Blake Chapin, you know, recover from that BYU game where it seemed like the team and the coaches didn't trust him throwing the football when that was the main reason they picked him as a starter over Gary Bahannon. Um, so I've enjoyed watching him come out and, and sling the rock around and have fun out there. Robert, I saw your tweet yesterday about buying a minority stake in, in the Washington Commanders and bringing some fans along with you. I ask that on behalf of my three friends here, both the Smokes and our producer Garrett, who are erstwhile Washington fans, what is your vetting process for that? <laughs> so, guys, guys, the vetting process for the, the 10 fans that hasn't even started yet because <laughs> – of, of course, to get in, you have to have the right relationship and, and, and have the right meeting with who the eventual buyer of the team is going to be. And that's all, you know, assuming or hoping or praying that Dan Snyder sells in general. Right now, they've just hired Bank of America to, to do an evaluation of the team. So um, yesterday was a really wild day. I know if you guys if you follow, follow me on Twitter, um, we got a $100 million offer to be a part of, a, of the minority ownership group. Um, and now today, like, uh, now we're up to $400 million in, in funds and offers to be a part of that minority ownership group. So um, it's a real thing. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, Dan's obviously got to sell the team, and then I've got to have the right conversation with whoever decides to put in bids to own the team. But I think any of them would, would, would probably take us seriously – with 400 million uh, at our disposal, um, just a whirlwind of information and calls and conversations from yesterday. Really exciting for me because, as you guys know, I was drafted um, by the Commanders, different name back then, but to the Washington Commanders now, and didn't really get to bring a championship to the city that I had hoped that I would be able to do. And to be a part of an ownership group that kind of can bring it full circle and, and try to provide a winner for the fans in D.C., is something that would be a dream come true for me. So uh, all this happening has just really blown my mind over the past 24 hours. Did what you saw happen after you left and even when you were there break your heart in some ways? Um, yeah, like, you know, anytime you get drafted somewhere, for me it was multiple things. One, uh, I wasn't a Washington uh, Commanders fan growing up. I was a Bronco fan. People would be like, oh, why weren't you a Cowboy fan? Well, the Cowboys weren't really all that great when I was growing up. The Broncos were uh, in the late 90s. So I kind of latched onto them. And who was the coach of the Broncos? Mike Shanahan. Mm-hmm. So I get drafted by the Washington Commanders and the head coach is Mike Shanahan. And I think I'm going to heaven. Right? I, this is my dream come true. And it, it ended up not being that way. So that was part of the heartbreak. And I had to figure out, like, do I still love football? Do I want to do this? And I found that love again and, and was able to stretch my career out to be an eight-year career. And then to see the stories that came out afterwards um, of, the, of things that were happening before I was there and then after I left, um, you just it, – it, it's heartbreaking because, you know, you want to be um, – a good, a good person. You want to be associated with good people. And it was just tough to see some of the people that I knew inside the building that were going through some tough times and some tough things um, with the organization. So uh, to be a part of uh, a new ownership group that can come in and kind of have a clean slate and give the fans what they deserve, uh, that, that would be something that would, like I said, just make it all come full circle. Um, and be a good thing for the city. It used to be such an incredible family when Jack Kent Cook owned it, and of course the the Joe Gibbs and, and so many things. It has been hard. It has really been hard for someone like me who only just happened to live there for when I was a kid. 
and grew up as a Washington fan. Even always will be, but it is it is so tough. Robert, my last question for you from me, and I appreciate your time today. When you look, and you've been all over the place, you've seen every, I think, Oregon State. Now you saw UCF, Cincinnati, Michigan. You see everybody. Is there too much uh, pigeonholing certain conferences as being better than others, even though some might be deeper, might have elite teams compared to others? But is it all pretty much the same? <laughs> Listen, I, you guys know me. You guys know me better than you know most people probably do. And uh, I've always prided myself in being honest and in in four forthcoming yep and the bottom line is when you guys see me do rankings whether it's the heisman top fives or teams to watch i don't ever do that based off of what fan base is going to engage the most i don't care about that um Amen. if a post i do does it if a post i do doesn't do well because the fan base that the post is about um isn't that engaging on social media it is what it is um, so when I do my rankings, I do them based off of who I think the best teams are or who I think should get in. I don't think that three SEC teams should get in to the college football playoff when it's only four teams. That, that's not a college football playoff. That's an SEC championship tournament. I don't think that two teams from the SEC and two teams from the Big Ten should get in. Now, there's a lot of reasons that I think that because if a team like TCU goes undefeated, they should be in the college football playoff. If a team like Clemson, who I don't think is one of the better teams in the country, but if they go undefeated and there's a one-loss Big Ten or one-loss SEC school, I think the Clemson should be in the college football playoff. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I do think there's too much pigeonholing because of the uh, strength of a conference. I do think there's too much pigeonholing because a team might bring more money and more visibility because of their brand. Um, I believe that. Every single year, the University of Texas is ranked. It doesn't matter what their record was the year before. They get ranked. And you know why they get ranked? They get ranked because of the power that they have uh, and because of the exposure that they can bring. Now, I do think that Texas is going to be better over the next three or four years with, with Sarkeesian and obviously Quinn Ewers and, and Arch Manning coming in. I think they have players. And, and what I saw when we called the game for them against Iowa State was impressive. Um, so it's not to talk bad about them in any way, shape, or form. But the bottom line is we got to stop like one conference is better than the other. Any team from any of the Power Five conferences, in my opinion, at the top, can beat any team at the top any day of the week. Uh, it just matters of how the ball drops. Look at what Tennessee's done this season. USC in the Pac-12 coming over with about 75 transfers, right? That's transfer you, and they've got one loss on the year and looking to punch their ticket to the college football playoffs. So I think we got to stop having these thoughts of like this team is the best team because of their name, their logo, and who their head coach is and start actually looking at what these teams are doing and how they're playing out year to year. So that's the answer I got for you. Robert Griffin the third, great to have you on the show. Always appreciate it. Continued luck with what you're doing, the broadcast, and, and we appreciate your loyalty to what we do as well. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you guys. God bless. Robert Griffin III, ESPN broadcaster. He's got A&M in Florida this week. He's had games throughout the country. He told me the, 